Some species are so common, we take them for granted. We rarely think about what they need to survive or how our actions will affect them. We assume that these animals will be around for centuries to come. But the reality is that we live in a complex world where all it takes is one shift in a system for even the most abundant species to disappear. Bald eagles were once a common sight in North America, leading to them being chosen as the symbol of the United States. But when the chemical compound DDT began to be used in insecticides in the 1940s, the birds dropped to critically low numbers. By 1963, there were only about 400 nesting pairs left in the contiguous United States. But how did an insecticide almost mean the complete extinction of a species of eagle? As it turned out, DDT got into the groundwater, ran into rivers and lakes, and contaminated fish stocks. When the bald eagles ate the fish, it caused a strange side effect. The shells of the bald eagle eggs would be so thin that even a light bump would cause them to break. Thankfully, the relationship between DDT and the eagle's decline was figured out in time. DDT was banned in the 1970s, and today there are hundreds of thousands of bald eagles in the lower 48. In today's video, we're going to look at four species that weren't so lucky. A shift in the system was either too sudden or too severe to stop their demise. These species went from being some of the most abundant living creatures on Earth to being declared extinct. Welcome to All About Nature. On my channel, I try to bring nature-related content that's entertaining and educational. If you like this kind of content, then please consider liking the video, leaving a comment, and even subscribing to the channel. I really appreciate your support. The passenger pigeon was known to Native Americans long before European settlement, but it gained scientific attention in the late 18th century, being formally described in 1766. Found east of the Rocky Mountains, from southern Canada to the southern US, it preferred the abundant deciduous forest that used to flourish in the region. The passenger pigeon was one of the most numerous bird species in recorded history, numbering as many as 5 billion birds across North America. Flocks were immense and awe-inspiring, with billions of birds darkening the skies for hours or even days at a time as they migrated. The passenger pigeon had a unique breeding behavior. They were known to breed in vast colonies, with nesting sites spanning many square miles. These colonies provided protection from predators and facilitated successful reproduction. They got the name passenger from their migratory nature. The birds would undertake long-distance migrations in search of food and sustainable breeding sites. Passenger pigeons were also an important source of protein to native people groups who would often move closer to nesting colonies during the breeding season to have easier access to one of their main game species. The birds were hunted relentlessly, even before Europeans arrived. But with the arrival of the gun from Europe, things got much worse. The Native Americans hunted the pigeons with a club, which could take down a dozen or so birds with one well-timed swing. But a shotgun could take down 60 plus birds with a single shot. One French explorer wrote that his colony killed over 200 birds in a day, and over 10,000 in only a few weeks around Fort Caroline in Florida. Overhunting was one of the main causes of the species' eventual extinction. Because they nested in communal groups, they were easily exploited for their meat and their feathers. There were also no effective regulations or conservation measures in place to protect the passenger pigeon. The species was seen as an inexhaustible resource due to its immense population, leading to uncontrolled exploitation without consideration for long-term sustainability. By the mid-19th century, over 50,000 birds were being hunted daily at some of the last remaining nesting sites. To make matters worse, European expansion to the colonies meant that much of the birds' habitat disappeared quickly and the species was unable to adapt. The species relied on old-growth deciduous forests for the vast quantities of food they required, 
as well as for sustainable nesting sites. But these forests were cleared for human settlement, agriculture, and fuel. By the time people realized the species was decreasing in number, it was too late. Even the protections placed over the passenger pigeons couldn't help them. The last known passenger pigeon, named Martha, died in captivity at the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. With her death, the species went extinct. And the ramifications of their extinction are still not fully understood to this day. The pigeons played a major role in seed dispersal, especially of hardwood trees such as beech, oak, hickory, and chestnut. In fact, the American chestnut has really struggled to thrive since the extinction of the passenger pigeon. Other predatory species also declined once the passenger pigeons went extinct. And even the cultural practices of native peoples were altered. The loss of the passenger pigeon is considered one of the most dramatic examples of human-induced extinction and has fueled conservation efforts to prevent the extinction of other vulnerable species. The golden toad was a small species of true toad that was endemic to the Monte Verde Cloud Forest Reserve in Costa Rica. The area of forest they inhabited was tiny, likely only a few square kilometers. But within that small area, the species was incredibly abundant. The golden toad was first discovered in 1964 by herpetologist Jay Savage during his fieldwork in the Monte Verde region. Its vibrant orange coloration, specifically in males, made it a remarkable and visually striking species. The discovery generated significant interest among scientists and herpetology enthusiasts due to its unique appearance. The golden toad was considered highly abundant within its limited range in Monteverde. During the 1980s, the population of this species was estimated to be in the thousands, and they were known to gather in large numbers when breeding, which typically occurred in the early months of the rainy season. The reproductive habits of the golden toad were fascinating. Males would gather at breeding sites called leks, where they would compete for the attention of females. The males displayed their bright colors and called out to attract mates. Females would select mates based on the quality of their territories and the volume of their calls. Unfortunately, the golden toad experienced a dramatic decline in population during the 1980s. In 1987, a normal population of toads was counted at a lek during the breeding months. But the following year, scientists only recorded 10 or 11 toads. Finally, in 1989, only one male toad was seen. Searches for the species would continue through the 90s, and in 2004, after an expedition that included Jay Savage, the very scientist who discovered the species, the golden toad was officially declared extinct. The exact reasons for its extinction are not fully understood, but several factors are believed to have contributed to its demise. Monteverde experienced a series of severe droughts in the late 1980s and the early 90s, which scientists speculate may have disrupted the breeding patterns and affected the species' survival. The species also suffered from habitat loss for agriculture. But the theory most commonly associated with its extinction is the chytrid fungus theory. The amphibian chytrid fungus is a highly contagious pathogen that has devastated amphibian populations worldwide. It's believed to have played a role in the extinction of numerous amphibian species, including the golden toad. However, the exact impact of this fungus on the golden toad population remains uncertain. The only thing we know for sure is that this beautiful species of amphibian, which once covered the jungle floor in the rainy season, has now been reduced to nothing but a memory. The Rocky Mountain Locust was a species of grasshopper that once inhabited the western regions of North America, particularly the Rocky Mountains and the Great Plains. It was first formally described by American entomologist Thomas Say in 1824. It gained attention due to its remarkable swarming behavior, which had significant ecological and economic implications. The Rocky Mountain locust was one of the most abundant and destructive insect species in recorded history. Swarms of locusts were reported to be immense, often stretching for hundreds of miles. 
Historical accounts describe these swarms as darkening the skies and causing widespread devastation to crops and vegetation. The locusts had a cyclical pattern of abundance, with populations reaching peak densities every 6 to 13 years. During these outbreaks, known as plagues, the locusts would gather in massive swarms consisting of billions of individuals. The swarms would migrate across vast distances, devouring vegetation in their path and causing severe agricultural damage. In the 19th century, the species underwent a rapid and mysterious decline. The exact cause of its extinction is not definitively known but a combination of factors likely contributed to its demise. For one, the settlement and extensive agricultural activities by European settlers in the Great Plains region led to the destruction of the locust's natural habitat. Large-scale conversion of prairies into farmland and the removal of native vegetation greatly diminished the locusts' available food sources and breeding grounds. The locust swarms were perceived as a significant threat to agriculture and extensive efforts were made to control and eradicate them. Intensive hunting, use of chemical pesticides, and deliberate destruction of locust eggs and breeding sites were employed, contributing to population decline. Recent research also suggests that the Rocky Mountain locust population had low genetic diversity, making it more susceptible to disease, environmental changes, and other stressors. This genetic vulnerability could have further contributed to its decline and eventual extinction. The last recorded sighting of the Rocky Mountain locust occurred in 1902 in southern Canada, and since then, extensive surveys and searches have failed to locate any living individuals. Amazingly, because it was so abundant, almost no examples of the species exist in private or museum collections today. Some of the few existing examples we have for science to study were actually discovered remains of the insects from frozen glacial deposits. The extinction of the Rocky Mountain locust had profound ecological impacts, including changes in plant communities and the loss of a crucial food source for various animals, especially one species of bird. The northern curlew was a migratory bird species that once inhabited North America, more widely known by the common name of Eskimo curlew because of its association with northern indigenous groups. This name is not really appropriate today, as the word Eskimo is generally considered derogatory by the native people groups of the Arctic. The species was first described by Carl Linnaeus in 1758. It was known for its long distance migrations. It bred in the Arctic tundra of Canada and Alaska, and during the non-breeding season it traveled to the grasslands of South America, primarily in Argentina. The northern curlew was once considered an abundant bird species. The exact population size during its heyday is uncertain. However, historical records and anecdotal evidence suggest that the species was once extremely common, with large flocks observed during its migrations. The birds relied on rich feeding grounds along the way to fuel their arduous journeys. Grasslands were essential stopovers for the species. Being that their main diet was insects and berries, it's theorized that the Rocky Mountain locust would have been an essential source of energy for the large migrating flocks as they passed over the plains of North America. As a result of the locust's extinction, the large flocks of northern curlew likely found it significantly harder to find sufficient food for their journeys. However, many scientists attribute the ultimate extinction of the species to other factors. The northern curlew experienced a rapid and severe decline in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Several factors contributed to its extinction. The northern curlew was extensively hunted for its meat, both during its migration and on its wintering grounds. As many as 2 million birds were being killed per year at the end of the 1800s. The birds were easily targeted due to their large flocks and predictable migration patterns. Unregulated hunting and commercial exploitation greatly reduced their population. And just like the Rocky Mountain locust, the species suffered from habitat loss. The conversion of native grasslands to agricultural fields 
and the destruction of wetlands in North and South America had a detrimental impact on the northern curlew. Loss of crucial stopover sites during migration and degradation of its breeding and wintering habitats further exacerbated the decline of the species. The last confirmed sighting of a northern curlew in the wild occurred in Barbados in 1963. Extensive efforts to locate the species since then have been unsuccessful, leading to its presumed extinction. The species is now classified as critically endangered, though it is likely extinct, and no reliable evidence of its survival exists. However, sightings have been reported on multiple occasions over the past six decades, some as recently as 2006. Efforts are ongoing to conserve and protect other migratory bird species to avoid the same fate as the northern curlew. And that's it for today's video. What type of video do you want to see next? I've considered making a few videos about cryptozoology, but I'm not sure if anyone might be interested in that. I also want to thank my patrons, Kasha and Lael. All two of you, thank you. I super appreciate your support on my videos. And if you want to see more content like this, consider supporting me on Patreon. You can check out the link in the video description below. I'm also still on my journey to being able to monetize my videos. This means I need 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch time hours in the last year. So if you're able to help me out with the algorithm and just leave a like on the video, a comment, maybe even share it with a friend, I would really appreciate that. That's all for today. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.